This is AutoLine This Week, the show that gets you inside the global automotive industry. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode. Hi, I'm John McElroy, and thanks for joining us on AutoLine This Week. You know, automakers are putting all kinds of safety equipment into cars these days. It's what they call ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And they can be terrific. They can make cars far safer. They can prevent accidents. They can prevent injury and fatalities even. But they can also make you want to pull your hair out. They can be so annoying at times. So today we're going to talk with some researchers who are addressing this issue. Let me introduce them to you, starting with Ross McKenzie. He's the Managing Director for the Center for Automotive Research at the University of Waterloo. Mark Crowley is an assistant professor of the Machine Learning Laboratory, also at the university. And Jim Queensberry is the director of research and development at Magna International. And I want to thank all three of you for taking the time to talk with me today. Uh, Ross, I guess I'll throw it out to you just to kick off the conversation here. Uh, You're all doing a study trying to figure out how to make ADAS systems, advanced driver assistance systems, more palatable to to drivers. Because all different kinds of drivers have all different kinds of abilities. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of the research that you're doing here? Well, overall, we're looking at the, the driver's behavior. So it's a, it's a driver behavior learning initiative where we're taking a sample set of 100 different drivers from different demographics with different driving experience, uh, cross section of the population, and observing how they react and respond to operating the vehicle with these ADAS functions engaged. And so, I mean, 100 drivers, what, what kind of driving did they do? Well, it's a... It's a course that runs, uh, depending on traffic, anywhere from 90 to 120 minutes. And it's a mix of urban driving along with a little bit of rural and then some freeway driving as well. Uh huh. Mark, uh, what all were you looking from for, uh, for from this research, especially with a machine learning background? Yeah, no, it's a it's a fascinating um, kind of project because uh, for machine learning researchers, all what we want basically is new challenging data, like hard things to to learn about. And humans are one of the hardest things to predict in the world. Um, And so uh, in driving, when we talked to Meg about this, like, oh, autonomous driving, driver assist, it's like, can you make the adaptive cruise control more more adaptive to the way you drive, right? So learning basically a driver's style. So how do you drive when you're on the road, right? How close do you follow someone? How do you take a turn? anything like that when you change lanes, all that kind of stuff. So we've got a bunch of kind of criteria we're searching for, but basically trying to collect as much data as we can about a driver going around. So we got LIDAR, radar, uh, cameras, other systems, and we got lots of data and we were find patterns and the patterns are essentially simple. Like, like those things I'm saying, how close do you follow someone on the road? Under what conditions? How do you take a turn? Um, so that when you hit that cruise control button, it would, um, drive more like you and to be more willing to kind of not complain about it. Like, why is it going so slow or, you know? Yeah. Jim, I, I'm uh, intrigued that, you know, you're part of the discussion. Magna, of course, makes a lot of these ADAS systems. What's your interest in this research and how might you bring back learnings into Magna? Thank you, John. Um, our interest is as we head down that long road towards full autonomy, there's a lot of effort put into driver assistance systems and a lot of value to be extracted from this, Uh, not just in how people interact with the systems and be able to personalize it, but in augmenting the safety aspect of this as well. I think as you learn more about driver's behaviors, you can put some boundary conditions around here to help those drivers be more safe. And what we would like to get from this is quite a bit actually there's the aspect that mark is working on with uh, machine learning and directly applying those in an automotive setting that's a very significant challenge that needs to be overcome and we hope to learn a lot from the university and the research team with mark on how to do that and how to make it integrated and work well with an automotive system we'd also like to obviously get a competitive advantage and offer something that no other tiered supplier can do and i think we're on the path to get there 
Well, let's talk about some of these technologies and let's start with adaptive cruise control, which can be terrific. You know, it automatically speeds up and slows down your car as you drive through traffic. But I've also found that it leaves a gap that lets other drivers cut in front of me. So they cut in front, now I back up more, and then somebody else cuts in and I back up more. Or conversely, it, uh, it will bring a car to a complete stop at a traffic light or a, a stop sign. The car in front of me pulls away and it just seems to sit there thinking and then it pulls away and people behind me are honking to get going. Uh, is this one of the technologies that you guys have addressed? Who wants to start with that? I could start because um, I had the same uh, feeling of a, a car with a lot of uh, adaptive cruise control built in um, and I'm constantly I love letting it drop like take off at least the pressure of holding my hands like strictly on the on like driving every moment. Um, but then I find uh, it frees up, you know, time to look around, but then I find I'm adjusting that distance level. We got three distances on my car of how close you follow someone, right? And I'm constantly like, oh, no one, no, we'll do two now, you know, to kind of change that gap. So the idea, one of the core first things we can do with this, we're hoping is to, you know, proof of concept show how um, by watching the way you drive over time, we could adjust what those levels should be. And maybe you could still say, I want to have a more of a gap right now, but what is your level one, two, and three in terms of your distance for follow, right? But how do we learn that based on just watching the way you drive your car. And, and a critical thing I didn't say before is we're not using any, we're not looking at having a camera on the driver or anything like that. So we're doing it purely by the way they drive it. Mm -hmm. And I think it builds on how the, the individual driver operates the car. So if I'm going along and I, I follow uh, 50 feet behind as compared to Jim and he's maybe taking uh, 60 feet distance, that data gets collected and it'll get compared demographically to uh, others in the in the data set from the drive that's done and then it'll allow ultimately the, the vision is to allow the adaptive cruise control to adjust to how I behave when I'm driving versus Jim or, or anyone else so it's it's learning that the differences in how I operate that vehicle how aggressively or how passively I am in my own driving and then it applies that over into the ADAS technologies that are relevant. Jim, uh, does Magna make these systems and do different automakers have different uh, settings? You know, as Mark was talking about, uh, I might be more comfortable being closer to a car in front of me. Other people may not be. It does it vary by manufacturer, or do you just give them a turnkey solution? It does vary by manufacturer, but not by much. The important thing is that that vehicle keeps a safe distance. So the closest setting still has to be a safe distance, and that varies by speed. The faster you go, the further distance you need to the vehicle in front. Um, then if you offer a customization setting, what that amounts to is additional software to be able to program that and um, in real time allow the user to uh, customize it. But it also adds uh, buttons and functionality to the steering wheel or to the instrument panel. If we have a more intuitive design that says Ross is learned in this way and he has that setting applied in the menu system, you can start to clean up the, the driver uh, viewing area, the steering wheel, remove physical buttons. And I think that's a tremendous advantage for a tier one supplier to be able to go in with a solution that allows that for the OEM to free up that space, reduce costs, and have a more tu intuitive, uh, personalized driving experience. Mark, I, I believe Hyundai's got some system that they claim is self-learning right now. Are, are you aware of that or are there other automakers that have that? Um, you're aware of some of the things um, they talk about, but usually um, when automakers talk about these things, they don't give a lot of details. So you can kind of say, well, here's how it works generally. So yes, that's how you would do it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, we can take those ideas or if there are things that are published um, and they show some concepts on it, we're using all of that and trying to build, you know, on top of it. Because as researchers, we want to build something that's to discover something that's novel and a new way to do something. So uh, it's... Um, it's always this uh, moving target. You're trying to basically 
go better than things that exist already. I guess a, a novel thing in ours is that we have more um, sensors. So we would assume that the car, we're gonna have uh, cameras and radar and LIDAR, although uh, you can handle any of them missing, but we're trying to see what you can do if you have all of those, um, how much better can you do? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about uh, another ADAS system, which is lane keeping. And uh, it'll do a couple of things. If you start to drift out of your lane, uh, in most cars, it'll give you a, a warning, a, a beeping. In some cars, it'll actually nudge the steering wheel so that you s stay in your lane. Again, I like the technology, but I find on some cars it can be maddening. The, the, the car's beeping at me all the time. And I also find that that, uh, that steering correction uh, also imparts uh, a sense of, how do I say it, uh, imprecision. It, it, it doesn't feel as direct, and I, I, I don't like that loss. Is, is this anything that your research has uncovered? Well, one of the things that's being measured as part of the, the demo drives that we're doing is where do you as a driver position the vehicle in the lane? And, you know, you know myself, if I'm on a, on a two-lane road and driving along, I tend to default a little bit more to the right hand or the shoulder side of the road. And for that data to be taken in under this study and know that I'm inclined to drive that way, I'm still within the, the confines of the lane markings, but I tend to default a little bit more to the right side of the lane. It will uh, recognize that and potentially, again, as, as Jim was saying, with the varying settings, you can have that uh, in, in part of the menu to allow for the vehicle to accept that as opposed to trying to bring you back to dead center of the lane. Yeah, and I think another thing that this comes to is is trying to get as, as uh, like autonomous systems and machine learning are getting integrated in further across the industry of these things to go beyond like um, the initial model saying, okay, we're just going to have, you know, a safe, well-defined, keep the car in the center of the lane and go at this yeah. speed that's exactly the speed limit and all these things and just define them as rules and say, well, that must be good. Right? And when you drive it, it feels very unnatural, right? So I guess part of the thing we can do once we have our data and have learned these models and people like, what is a natural way to drive and keep a lane in the middle that humans actually do? Um, and use those as the baselines rather than some formula that says, well, the center, obviously, because nobody mm -hmm. does that, right? Um, so you, machine learning can help you learn kind of a more natural pattern and use that as the baseline rather than some strict rule. Now, yeah. I really like the, the learning aspect, sorry, John. Um, that these systems come with a predetermined set of uh, steering control based on the set of inputs, speed and uh, lateral acceleration and deceleration. But most of the time, all of the time in assist systems, the driver has their hands on the wheel and that changes the torque response uh, on the steering wheel. Having the ability to learn over the use of the vehicle really improves that system because you're improving the input to the machine learning model. So now when you have a steering correction applied and the driver has their hands on the wheels, you're getting a better set of input for that model. And that's what we hope leads to a better overall experience for the user. Yeah, that's a great point. Ross, I'm like you. If I'm on a two lane road, I tend to hug the right hand side. But if I'm driving on the freeway, uh, I'm generally in the left hand lane and I hug the left-hand side of the road at that point. And, and so it would be unnatural to me to have the car directly centered in the lane, which logically you would think is the best. And then uh, as sort of a follow-up on that, on these automatic driving systems such as Cadillac Super Cruise, um, it positions you in the center of the lane. And when you pass big semi trucks, I think everybody tends mm. to naturally go left or right and hug their side of the lane to give themselves more room with those trucks. But it certainly early versions of uh, of Super Cruise and, and other systems did not do that. They just kept you planted right smack in the middle. Uh, I got to believe that these are things that you're talking about that uh, the car can learn my preferences. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, even even things as, you know, straightforward, we might think of, you know, getting into the the exit ramp of a of a freeway. Well, 
how quickly do you do that? Do you do you typically do that halfway through? Do you do it right when it's first available to you, or are you a bit of a scrambler that that tends to get in just before the the solid line comes up? And again, for the vehicle to know that and anticipate how you drive, it can not only customize to reduce those potential annoyances from ADAS, but it can also be alerted to your tendencies. And if you're a, uh, a late entrant to the, the exit ramp, it, it can, um, in, in the bigger picture, possibly even compensate for that and perhaps provide you with a little bit more of an advanced notification off of a routing map as compared to somebody who tends to get into that exit ramp as soon as the markings widen out and create the lane. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we're also interested in. It's not the core part of the study, but we're looking at like detecting anomalies or, you know, unnatural behavior because we kind of have to do that because machine learning models work better if all of the data you give it are kind of similar, right? So when we're doing our data, we have people from different ages and, and groups, but if we can get some broad thing about, okay, there's an aggressive driver or not aggressive driver, if we train models on each of them, they'll work better because they have more things in common, right? But that right. saying that then once you know what's normal for someone, once they reach kind of near the edge of something, like, you know, they're late and exiting highways, you could give them more warnings because you, you have to get them to do it earlier or that they go left, you know, they go left when they're passing a truck, but there's another truck on the left, the car might get more careful to make sure they don't go over that line. I mean, theoretically you could do that. And, uh, Let's see here. We've got also a uh, forward collision warning to, to talk about as well. Uh, there's been times where I've been driving cars and the car abruptly puts on the brakes because it's detected, as you guys would know the terminology, a false positive. Uh, are these things that you're taking into account as well when you're doing your research? I guess I'll ask that one too. Um, absolutely. Um, that's, but that's a, so that's a universal uh, challenge in any kind of uh, machine learning system, right? So how do you make sure that the data you're reacting to um, is really the thing you think it is? So we do something called classification, right? So we'll look at a situation and say, is this dangerous? Is this safe? Is this a turn? Is this an intersection? We know because of the map as well, so we can help with that. Like there was an intersection coming up, but a car in front of you, it's like, okay, is this a situation where we're about to hit a car, right? Um, and I guess the existing systems have things like time to collision and all that is already calculated. So, um, but uh, you could you could do more. And so when we're looking at multi fusing multiple sensors, trying to help it remove those false positives and say like, I know your radar says there's something there, but the cameras don't and everything else is fine. So maybe we warn the driver, but maybe it's a piece of snow on the radar, which happens. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Jim, you know, uh how much of this are you going to be able to incorporate into these systems? Because I, I would love to have any car that I'm in start to learn how I drive, what my preferences are, and make me more comfortable as I go along. That's a really good question. And I think the examples that have been brought up today kind of allude to the complexity that the system must handle through all of this. Um, it's an ever-changing scene in front of the vehicle. Every day is different. Even if you drive the same route, you have a different set of vehicles in front of you, different weather conditions. That's where the challenge in the research needs to be. As Mark was already talking about, detecting anomalies. How do we know that that set of data inputs is good? Um, that needs to be figured out uh, before we can fully widespread deploy this to, to every vehicle and every system that we have. But I think we can start to see uh, where it has an impact, uh, whether the OEM customer is looking to reduce physical buttons or provide a better experience, we can entertain certain use cases and scenarios where we'll start to get this in and, and we'll have a more uh, personalized driving experience for adaptive cruise control. I test drive a lot of cars uh, in my course of work. Uh, some cars I don't have any problems with, others I find very annoying. They're constantly beeping at me, it seems. Uh, have you encountered this in your testing? To uh, Because in some cases, literally, I'll turn the system off. And I'm sure you must have encountered that, or have you? 
Yeah, no, well, I guess for our specific project, um, that doesn't really apply because we're using just one car. Um, so uh, Magna basically kitted out a car really nice with all kinds of sensors on it, um, uh, an SUV, and um, that's what we're using. And we actually have the adaptive cruise control off during this because we're trying to collect data about the human driver. Mm -hmm. So there are no distractions uh, if we're in our particular study, just um, the, the navigation system telling them what their next turn is going to be. Jim, I've got to believe, though, that you've uh, you've certainly heard about this, of drivers turning off their safety systems because it's, they just find it so annoying. I can't think of a worse situation to turn a safety system off because it's annoying. A lot of effort on the sensors and the system integration goes into making sure that doesn't happen. But unfortunately, it still does happen because think about your user base. You have every type of human driver and every type of preference available. You can't satisfy all of them with a pre-programmed logic-based system. Um, so it, it does happen, but we want those safety systems on all the time, keeping people safe and providing a better, more convenient experience. Ross, what kind of uh, advice would you give to automakers and suppliers then as, as to how to reduce this annoyance? I think it's twofold. It's it, what we've been talking about in terms of you know, lowering the tendency of a system like automatic emergency braking to respond too soon or, or too harshly. Uh, and if it can more closely mimic how you operate the vehicle yourself, you know, if you're an aggressive driver and you tend to brake hard, it's not necessarily going to replicate that, but it's it's going to maybe have a tendency to do that if it had to more readily than somebody who's a gradual uh, ease on the brake pedal type driver. But the, the other part of it comes back to something Jim mentioned earlier in our discussion here today, and that is to simplify the process. And whether that's the, the inputs or the information that's coming onto the the dashboard for the driver, or or even the steering wheel itself. You know, there are uh, vehicles out there that have 20 to 25 different functions available to either your left or right hand. You've got your turn signal. You don't have a gear shift much anymore, but there's another um, paddle for uh, doing cruise control on some models, and yet the third paddle for lights and uh, and wipers. And so, if we can simplify what all of the environmental surroundings are that the driver needs to have and keep track of, that's going to contribute to the safety of operating the vehicle as a driver. But I think it's also going to contribute to the experience for the driver because there's a little less anxiety because there's, there's fewer things to keep track of and, and know how to handle. Boy, that is so true. I, I've been in some cars where the steering wheel alone not off to the left or right of it, right on the steering wheel, might have uh, 14 or 16 different buttons on it. And some of those buttons take you into menus and you can click down into multiple screens. So it, it, just the steering wheel alone can get very complicated. Jim, uh, what what are you learning from, from this research? I mean, uh, how valuable has it been for you? It's been incredibly valuable. We've learned quite a few aspects of machine learning. Uh, what's important about the inputs to that, to building that algorithm, how we're collecting data, how we share data. We've even gotten into the uh, privacy aspect of what do you do with data that you've collected on public roads? And luckily we have a great support team in the university and, and Magna that can help us solve those issues. Uh, but we've also learned quite a bit about how fantastic it is to work with the University of Waterloo and how deep their research expertise is and how diverse the research team can be. And that's something that we greatly appreciate is having access to these researchers and have them work with us on industry problems. So it's twofold here, uh, the specifics about machine learning applications and the benefits that we can get from the University of Waterloo. Mark, has anything surprised you, delighted you, annoyed you from this research? Uh, yeah, no, we've had lots of uh, great moments with it. I mean, we've had a lot of struggles with uh, COVID and timing because we're collecting data from drivers. Um, you know, we need participants to come in and drive our car. And so when we were shut down, we couldn't do that. We're starting that up again now. Um, so there's been frustrations that way. But um, 
it's uh, it's exciting to see what you can do with um, so many different types of data. So like, there's always a challenge trying to clean them up and, and get just the part you need for your aspect. But often we'll be trying to think of some complicated thing we need to do. Like, well, can we calculate how far, like how many seconds it'll be until we you would hit the car in front of you or whatever. And then we talk to someone at Magnus like, oh no, that's a feature, like that's already calculated. So there's lots of complexity and intelligence already in the sensors. Your computer, your car has so many computers in it. Our car that we're using has another two big computers in the back trunk to collect data, but there's so much in there already. So we're really trying to use stuff that already exists in the car um, to do as much, squeeze as much kind of uh, learning and intelligence out of what you have, can. Right? Ross, I need a real quick answer. We're down to less than a minute here. What do you really hope that this this research leads to? I would hope that the research leads to uh, commercializable outcomes for Magna, so they could take some of these lessons learned and enhance the ADAS functionality overall, which is, is an important lesson because as we go along, the complexities of ADAS and what technology will allow are only going to increase. Very good. With that, we're going to wrap up this discussion. Jim Queensbury, Mark Crowley, Ross McKenzie, thank you so much for your time today. I can't wait for cars to learn the way I want to drive. Great to be with you. Thank you very much. AutoLine This Week partnered with the Consulate General of Canada in Detroit to produce this episode.